Lord God, we thank you tonight that you came and you stood in our place, that you were crucified. Lord, that you took on sin for us, that you became sin so that we would not have to suffer our penalty. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, soften our hearts to your will tonight. Open our hearts to what you have for us, that we can receive those good things from your hand, Father, that we know you long to give us. Lord, let us be at a place tonight where we're expectant of you to show up. God, we ask you to come now. Holy Spirit, fill this place as we invite you here through our worship, God. Just fill our hearts tonight with rank and God. You are my desire.
lay it all down for the sake of you, my King.
being used. Lord, I just pray a special blessing on my brother Gary as he comes. Mr. Wilkerson, to you folks, that the Lord would just bless him. And Lord, put your words in his mouth and in his heart to you. I thank you for my brother, for my friend. Just watch over his family while he's gone. Speak to us in ways that renew us, change us, transform us, and move us into the more into the likeness of your Son, Christ Jesus. Yes. We give you thanks for these things. Bless your words. Bless the hearers of the word. Let us be doers of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, I am from the, uh, I think I'm the, I'm not sure the exact number, but the fifth or sixth generation minister, pastor, evangelist in our family. Uh, my father, uh, some of you may have read his book called The Cross and the Switchblade, and uh, heard of his ministry uh, through Teen Challenge, the drug rehabilitation program. Uh, but most of you probably don't know that even his father was a minister as well, and for a while pastor here in Indiana. And uh, uh, then his father was a uh, tent revivalist. Are you familiar with that term? Somebody who traveled around, had a big old tent, and he just traveled all around the countryside, he'd be preaching. And uh, he was, a, I guess what they called those days, a firebrand. Have you heard that terminology? Somebody who would preach health, fire, and brimstone. And if the people in the tent were not paying attention, like some of you looking over there at the pastor instead of me, if, if they weren't paying attention to him, he'd get really upset. So he had these, he had these little um, pieces of gunpowder rolled up in paper. And before he would come out with to the platform, he'd put that gunpowder behind him on the stage, and if the crowd got too quiet or didn't listen, he'd back up and start stepping on those things, and sparks and smoke would come up from the stage, and then he'd get uh, his attention. So that was my uh, great-grandfather, and uh, from what I understand, even his father was a pastor as well, uh, down in the south, uh, just after the Civil War. So. Um, so if anybody could say they grew up in church, I could say I grew up in church. Although I actually grew up in my home, but you know what I mean. I was in church a lot, often. And um, uh, I, I counted a privilege. I come from a godly heritage. And I grew up in an environment of faith where I saw through my family, my grandfather and my father and my grandmother and my, gran and my mother believing that nothing is impossible with God. That nothing is too difficult for the Lord. I, uh, my father wasn't there when I was born. I was born in a small town in Pennsylvania. And the very week that I was being birthed from my mother, uh, my father was uh, leaving his small church in Pennsylvania where he was pastoring and had gone to spend much of the summer, the summer of July, uh, particularly the July of 1958. And that summer, and that, that week that he was there preaching at a place called St. Nicholas Arena, and he gathered about 300 young people together, but not like sort of for a, uh, a Royal Rangers conference or a uh, youth 
the live type thing. It was these were all gang members, about 300 from various different drugs, uh, excuse me, from different gangs throughout New York City. And they gathered together. They gave an invitation, and one young man, particularly, um, was was pierced in his heart by the Lord, uh, and he gave his life to Jesus that week. His name was Nicky Cruz. Many of you are familiar with Nicky Cruz and his ministry. And so now every time I see Nicky Cruz, it's a great delight because he asks me how old I am, and I tell him my age, and he just gives me this big hug and says, thank you for, you know, that your father wasn't there with you, with me. <laughs> because, uh, because I was born into the kingdom spiritually the same week you were born into the world physically. So we're, we share a birthday, and we, we are brothers. And he just gives me this big hug. He's, he's so full of love. It's just a, a delight. And I am, as I said, so thankful to be, uh, have the privilege of growing up in this environment of faith where I saw from childhood that when we see problems, when we see crisis, when we see, as Isaiah calls it, the darkness that covers the earth and the gross darkness that covers the peoples, that we see that God desires to raise up a light in the midst of that darkness. Yeah. And I, think, I, I have just grown to believe that the greater the darkness, the more God desires to be in the middle of it to bring his light. Yeah. The worse off a situation is, the more God desires for people like you and I to throw ourselves into the midst of that. Say, God, yeah. we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to do it. We say, like Solomon, we're, we're young men, we're young women. We don't know how to go in or come out. But we trust in you, and we'll be in the middle of the situation. And my father went to New York City to work with gang members, and, and uh, it was at a time when they said, these kids are too violent. Just throw them in jail, throw away the key, put them in an electric chair, do away with them. These gangs should be is totally terminated from the face of the earth. And he said, no, God has a different plan for these young men's lives. And he gave himself in that situation. A few years later, the gangs kind of started to dissipate in New York City because of the use of heroin. And when you're on heroin, uh, it, 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 it takes you to a place where you don't feel like fighting over your turf anymore. You're not interested in whether or not somebody walks by your neighborhood. You're just down and you're out and you're lost and you're hopeless. And at that time in New York City, uh, the, the the governor of the state of New York did a, a several million dollar study of the heroin problem in New York City. And after employing psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists and social workers and medical doctors that, and government workers, the conclusion after this million dollar year long study was, and it came out of New York Times headline, there is no cure for a heroin addict. And my father saw that and he said, oh, here's a good chance for God's name to be glorified. When man says it's impossible, this is, this is exactly where the church belongs. Right in the places where, where the world says it's too difficult or it can't be done. So he moved into a new venture with what's, as you, some of you may be familiar, Teen Challenge was birthed out of that. A desire not just to see a drug addict saved and set free, but to see God's name glorified and the fact that God is the God of the impossible. Amen. Not too long after that, the, 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 the drug culture of New York turned into um, the, the attention changed coast. It went from New York City to California, and there was this thing called the hippie movement. And uh, my father got involved with that as well, starting uh, youth crusades, and he traveled all around the world. Now, this is the time I started. I was probably 10, 11 years old at the time, and started traveling around with him as he preached in different places. And what an amazing thing to see these these. Um, you know, because I grew up, as I said, in the church, a small uh, Sons of God church in New York. And everybody wore a suit on a Sunday and um, slept halfway through most of the sermons, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, it was, just a, it was just church. And then to go into these meetings and see, like, all, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand young people coming. Some of them didn't wear shoes and they had cut off blue jeans. And, some of them didn't have shirts on, and some of them were smoking pot during the meeting. And, and to see that in the altar call, they're coming up there and they're throwing their cig pot cigarettes onto the stage, saying, we give it up, throwing heroin needles on the stage and being set free. Matthew Ward and second chapter of Acts uh, was launching at that, around that same time, pretty much, uh, getting into the, to the, to the throes of the Jesus movement, that same faith, believing that nothing's impossible for God. And out of that, the second chapter of Acts and other music ministries, God used to, to see the same thing happen, that where there is the most difficult of times, the most crucial of problems in a nation, and God is in the midst, throwing himself fully through people who have faith and vision and hope and belief that we're set here on earth for more than 
sitting in a pew. We're, we've been sent here on earth for more than just hearing sermons. And I come to you tonight not as a sermon giver. I come to you tonight not as an eloquent speaker. I come to you tonight not as one who you want to measure compared with other speakers you've heard as guest speakers in your church or uh, now even on the internet. There's no way to compete with the, 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 the wonderful voices that go out across the land. But I, I'm just here as a simple servant of the Lord mm -hmm. to, to encourage you, to challenge you, to say, rise up, O church of God. Yes. Rise up, O church of God, Amen. because this is the day. Amen. This is the hour. And we are here, Matthew and I are here in this place at this time, not by accident, not by coincidence, it's not just to fill a schedule. We can be in many different places, but we're here because God said to come to this place. Amen. And I have to be assured that he sent us here because there's somebody listening to my voice tonight who's going to hear particularly what God is saying, that in the midst of the most difficult circumstances and situations, he has called you to say, God, fill me with faith. Fill me with Holy Ghost power to believe that you can make a change in this world through my life. Yes. Right. We can start right here in our own locale. We can start right here in our own city and say, God, there's a mission for us. There's a task for us. There's a vision you have for us that goes beyond the four walls of our local church. Amen. The four walls of our local church exist to serve the world outside. I've heard it said that the church is the only organization or institution that exists not for its own members, but for its non-members. Yeah. That, that we exist for, our, for those who don't know Christ, yes. for those who are poor, for those who are troubled, for those who are in the most difficult circumstances and situations in the world today. So, so I believe with all my heart that God has, has sent us here to speak to you and to challenge you and say, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for this church. Some of you come from other locales and situations. God has a plan for you where you are. It's not a mistake that you're here in this room tonight listening to my voice. God has a plan for your life. He's called you here to challenge you, to, to say to you there, there is more than just hearing sermons or preaching sermons. There is more than just praying prayers or singing songs. There is something that he wants to stir in your heart to give each of you a vision for something you can do. And I believe that God loves and delights to use very simple people to confound the wise, yes. to use very simple, ordinary people to take on challenges far beyond their skill level, far beyond their ability, so to speak, to solve that particular problem. Yes. But many Christians, sadly, have their eyes closed to the problems of the world around them. I, I uh, gave a, uh, a talk not long ago, and, and we put it out on our, I work for a ministry called World Challenge, and we put it out on our, on our website, and uh, the first day it was, the, the sermon was on the internet, I, I got a, 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 an email from somebody and said, uh, please take us off your mailing list, I will not follow you or listen to your website sermons ever again, because you were talking about how troubled the world is, how many people are starving, and how, much, how many people in Africa are infected now with the HIV AIDS virus, and how many children are being orphaned. And he said, I was listening to your sermon, I got depressed. He said, if I want to get depressed, I could listen to the news, so please, I don't want to hear any more that you have to say. Oh, boy. And I know that's, that's probably on the far end of ridiculous, but many of us have a, 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 a small bit of that in our own hearts. Many of us have a, a slight attitude that says, I just, you know, I just want a good life, and I want things to be comfortable, and I want things to go well, and I just want to go to my job, and I want to come home, and I want to get a paycheck, and I want my kids to go to school, and graduate from high school, and I hope they get a good job, and go to work in the morning, and get a paycheck, and have a good life, and have kids who go to work, and get a paycheck, and on and on and on. But Jesus says, you know, I don't want that. That's not what I have for you. That's part of what I have for you, yes. But there's something in my heart, God says to his church, to, to quicken us, to, to say yes. And the first thing we need to do is open our eyes to the crisis around us. Open up our eyes to our own community and get our eyes off just saying, Lord, what is, what's in it for me? Or what, what do you want to do to bless me today? Now, I believe in being blessed. My lifelong pursuit has been to know Christ, to love him to walk in intimacy, to be in communion with Christ. When I was 19 years old, I went to a conference and I heard a man, his name was Peter Lord, and he 
preached this powerful sermon. It changed my life. He said, you'll have a choice in your life to either choose the face of Christ or the hand of God. And many will choose the hand. God, do this, and move in power, and make this happen. But very few choose his face to know him, to love him, to be intimate with him, to have, have a first love passion, to have that Mary of Bethany heart just says, Lord, I just want to pour out my life before you. Just to be intimate and know you. That has been, at 19 years old, I decided, God, that's the way I want to go. I want to know your face. I want to walk in intimacy with you. And I've never turned to the left or to the right. That's been my heart's desire. It still is today. And yet out of that desire, that one thing passion, that Mary of Bethany heart, that renewing your passion for Jesus, out of that, there's an overflow of that devotion that turns communion into compassion. Did you hear what I said? The, the, out of that communion with the face of Jesus, out of that communion, out of that devotion, is an overflowing heart of compassion. And that's the way God planned it. That's the way God intended it to be. But the, there's a problem. There's a crisis that we're facing, and it's this, that the over isn't flowing. Yeah. The over has gotten stuck. Yeah. And it's in containers. Paul called them vessels. In good language. But he never intended the vessel to be the only place of filling. He meant for us to be overflowing. Amen. And out of that love for Jesus, of knowing his face, of wanting to walk in intimacy, comes this compelling passion and desire to be a man or a woman who gives their life away. Amos, the fifth chapter. Let me read this to you. You're welcome to turn with me if you want. If not, just listen carefully to these words. And, and, and it sounds like I'm... I might be discouraging you here for a moment or depressing you, and I'm not. There's, there's, there's great joy in what I have to say here tonight, but first let's look at some difficult words. God says to his own people who, who were obviously pursuing to some degree, to some level, to some measure, they were pursuing communion with God. But he says to them, I hate, I despise. This is Amos chapter 5 and verse 21. I hate, I despise your religious feast. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice flow, or roll on like a river. Let righteousness, like a never-failing stream, let it flow. Let it flow. God is saying that the, the rivers got clogged up. The outpourings got stopped within you. You thought that the flow of the Spirit was intended to, to be an individual blessing for you and to increase you and to bless you and increase you and bless you and increase you and bless you. And it's become a faith that is, it's all about me. It's all about what God can do for me. It's, it's my interest. It's my desires. God exists to serve my needs and my wants and my interests. And that stops the flow. Yeah. As I said, the over isn't flowing in the overflow of compassion. Now, this raises an interesting question to me. How could communion not flow into compassion? It doesn't seem like that's possible. It seems like someone who is really seeking the Lord's face would become compassionate. But can I speak the truth to you? The reality that I see is I travel all over the world. I've been in probably 50 nations in the last five years, and, and I speak to pastors all over the world, and, and many pastors are seeing the same situation of, of, of Christians just like ourselves, who love God and want to seek His face, and yet somehow the flow has stopped with ourselves, and this communion has not translated into true compassion. You okay out there? Yeah. Making you mad at me? Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> How could this communion not flow into compassion? How could our intimacy with Jesus not translate into true action to be an activist for God in a world in need? How could this ever happen? I believe it's for one main thing. And there are, I'm sure there are many other additional things that could be said about this, but I see one thing, particularly in the American church, that I don't find when I'm in South America very often, that I don't find when I'm in Africa among the poor churches. I find it almost exclusively in the wealthy American churches that which, to be honest, we're a part of. And, and I find it, it's a consumer-driven mentality. Yeah. It's, it's a mentality that the church is 
is a consumer institution, and I go into it, and I see if it offers me what I want. And as long as it offers me what I want, I'm happy, and the pastor will get my, well, I probably won't get my 10%, but you know, if we're a fairly good Christian, my 3 or 4%, and, and I won't complain very much, and I'll sit there, and I'll sing the songs, and I'll hear the sermons, and I'll participate in the church services. And yet, God is, is, is asking for more than that. He's not wanting us to measure the church by what it's like as a consumer. And what happens then if the church offends you or doesn't meet your consumer needs? Or someone starts a new church down the street and they have better consumer-driven opportunities for you, better gymnasiums for your children or better youth programs. They'll leave that church and go to another church just so they can get their own needs met. There's not an attitude of service. There's not an attitude of commitment any longer. There's no more dying to self. It's a matter of where's the best place for me to get something that's exciting and stimulating and stirring to my heart. Now, yes, you want to be stirred in your heart, but this has caused a whole culture of church hoppers. They go from one place to the next, looking for the next revival, the next event, the next big thing down the Christian pike. And it's built a consumer-driven mentality in our life. Uh, I was, there was this commercial on TBS a few years ago, and, and I couldn't believe it. It was, it, was, it was bizarre. There was a woman in the kitchen, and she was using this dishwashing soap, and she was putting in her dishwasher, and her kids were like, really tired and having a hard time doing their homework, and her husband had just walked in the door, and he was miserable and cranky, and there was some food on the table, but it looked like it had been poorly prepared. And no one was talking to each other. And then the next night, she chooses this dish, different kind of dishwashing soap. And she pours it in there. And all of a sudden, her glasses begin to sparkle, and her plates. And then her kitchen lit up. And then the dining table lit up. And the kids got happy. And the husband walked in the door and gave her a big hug and kiss. And the, then the ad said, like, you know, use whatever dishwashing soap. It will brighten your world. Okay, so here's the here's the here's the thought that here's what the here's the hook, and the thing they're trying to bring you in to say, ah, so if I use that dishwasher, so they will, the idea is it will make my dishes cleaner, but it will change my life. If I drive this car um, and I'm single, I'll have better opportunities with the women around instead of that car. So so they're not selling you a car; they're selling you sex appeal. They're, they're not selling you a dishwashing soap, they're selling you a good life. And that's called a consumer-driven mentality. Yeah. And the church of Jesus Christ has always bought into that. Mm -hmm. And said, hey, we can sell Jesus. We can tell people, if you, if you will just come to some meetings and, and uh, attend and be, participate, then you'll get all these wonderful things. You'll, you'll become rich beyond your wildest dreams. You'll be happily married. Your, 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 your angry old husband will just turn into a saint overnight. No more complaining. And not only that, his paycheck will double. And you will be going to Hawaii very soon. If you become rich. <laughs> and here's the guys that say, Amen. <laughs> and, and so people are presented this gospel that says it, uh, Jesus is a product. And if you'll just give a little bit of yourself, then you'll get all of this back. There's a real problem with that. Jesus as a consumer product is terrible. <laughs> now, Jesus never fails. But if he were to be ever put in the place of being a consumer product, he'd be a total failure. Because he doesn't sell himself very well. You can imagine his commercials. Um, would you like to be a follower of mine? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. <laughs> Lay down your life. You want to bury your father? No, don't do that. Come, come right away and follow me. What, what do you expect? They'll take houses from you. Yeah, you'll get some later, but you're going to lose them now. You're going to have this and that. He just, he's not a good marketer. He just doesn't market himself the way Madison Avenue in New York City wants someone to market the product that they're trying to sell to us. And, and so since Jesus did such a poor job, the church has decided to help them out a little bit. And say, Jesus, we know how to market you better. Let's, first of all, make you a little bit softer. 
<laughs> so instead of rugged hands and scarred skin and, 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 a, and a burdened heart and, and tears that were like blood coming from your brow, let's, let's, let's put you in a, a holiday and bathrobe, you know, with a Miss America sash across it, sash across it, and, and sort of like you can float around and say, come, follow me, and, you know, don't you, aren't I attractive? Have you ever seen a picture of Jesus? He's always really attractive. And, and, and the Bible seems to say otherwise about the way he appeared. And there was nothing about his appearance that would draw a man over to him. It wasn't an outward sense of, of, of wooing that people would draw to him or something in his heart, something much deeper. And this consumer mentality, this, this consumer drivenness has, has, a, uh, has a kick to it. It has, a, it has something to it. It has a catch to it. Because Christ never set himself up to be a consumer product. Therefore, the product doesn't work the way the promise is given. So the promise is, if you'll pay this little bit just to buy this product, then you'll get all this. And Jesus says, no, that's not what I'm about. You, you have to lay down your life to follow me. You have to die to yourself. You have to seek the good of others more than yourself. You have to be willing to to love your enemies, not just those who do good to you. You have to be willing to, to, to be persecuted for my sake. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And because of that, we, we, we say, well, I like the other gospel. I like the one that says, if I say something out of my mouth, I'll get what I want. I want a new Cadillac. Boom, a new Cadillac appears in my driveway. <laughs> or we want the thing that says, I want my kids to be well adjusted. I want my marriage to be perfect. And I want my finances to be just a, a, a thrilling monument to success, constantly growing, ever increasing. I want my health to always be without difficulty. I want my boss to always speak well to me. I want my neighborhood to be, every lawn to be mowed perfectly, no weeds growing. And that's what we sometimes think that Christianity is about. But the problem with that though is when it doesn't work, and it doesn't. Your lawn gets weeds, your neighbors are cranky, sometimes you aren't nice to your wife, sometimes your children bring home report cards that aren't good, sometimes the doctor says the report doesn't look well. And Christians who have bought into Jesus as a consumer product will immediately say, wait a minute, this is not what I signed up for. That's not, that's not why I'm in the church. That's not why I'm participating. I'm not, I, I, I thought he said this. I thought he promised me. And what happens is there's an immediate sense of disappointment. I thought God was going to give me all this. And he's giving me less than he said he was going to give me. He's giving me less than he promised. Therefore, I have issue with God. I am angry with God. There is a host of people all across the church in America today who are angry with God. Because he's not lived up to his end of the bargain never made the bargain, but it was one that they were promised. One that they were taught to believe and that it was really a lie. And therefore, they have now an issue with God, and there's bitterness. Paul said, don't let this root of bitterness get up in your soul, but these people are full of bitterness now. And they're leaving the church by droves. And just falling back away, that's why the Bible says, in the last days, the love of many would grow cold. It's because something has come and choked away. The communion. The communion was there. The, the peace was there. But something, the kid in the Bible says it's the, what? The cares of this world. The cares of this world came and choked those things away. And so sometimes it seems to be there's, a, there's this suggestion in the scripture that sometimes when people come to Jesus as a consumer saying, what will you do for me? And please don't get me wrong, Jesus does things for you, doesn't he? Yeah. He does good things. He does some mighty things. He does wonderful things far beyond our wildest dreams and expectations. But the things he's done for me, if I would be direct with you, are very different than the things I thought he was going to do for me. And the way he did them are completely different than the way I wanted him to do them. <laughs> Almost every time he has done things, in my consideration, backwards. In my understanding, the wrong way. And, and, I, and, I, and sometimes I get to the to place, and, and you know, only my wife's probably knows this in, in real depth, but, but sometimes I get to this place where I say, man, I'm, just, you know, I'm not sure God's doing that great a job. Mm -hmm. just, you know, if he was really wise, he would probably just make me a little bit more like this, you know, or do a little bit more of that. And he's not doing that, and I'm really confused and kind of disappointed. And kind of, 
makes me a little bit mad. I, and I just don't understand what, what God's doing in this. And it all comes down from a, at the core of a refusal to understand the gospel. That, that God does, he does wonderful things in our life. He does miracles for us and he heals and he delivers and he sets us free and he prospers us. But he does it according to a, a higher agenda, a higher call. Because he's working to get something in our life. He's working to get at us in a certain way. He's looking to mold us into his image. He's looking to, to forge in us uh, the, the, like, like the, on the anvil, in the, in the fire, and being sometimes struck. He's creating us. He's renewing us. He's changing and transforming us. And, it will, and there is in the American culture a refusal to suffer. We have eliminated the teaching of suffering from the gospel. And, and now it's just come to Jesus and get all these wonderful blessings. And when people are suffering, they say, this isn't a blessing, this is suffering. I'm leaving. They don't understand. No, don't leave. You were intended to suffer. You were called to suffer. Persecuted? No, don't claim you're not going to be persecuted. Understand you will be persecuted. Understand you will find trials and tribulations in your life. So that when they do come, you won't be distraught. You're expecting them. So, so you won't have false expectations that go unmet. Do you understand? Amen. If you have a false gospel, you have false expectations, and those expectations will never be met, you will be disappointed, and there will be bitterness spring up in your soul. But if you have an understanding that you're going to suffer, you're going to have hardship in your life, and there will be persecutions and trials and tribulations, and this is a part of the glory that God is using to mold our life. This is something He's working in us that causes us to be far surpassingly more filled with His glory than we could ever be with just a, a life of sailing on a beautiful lake all day long. Yes. That is, that is, it is, it is in this fiery furnace that forges the, the fullness of His power in our life. And there's God, and He's saying to us, if you have this, this sense of refusing to suffer, you won't stand in the day of trial and tribulation. The bitterness will spring up and it will choke out that communion. And therefore, it will never translate into compassion. Now, I'm not, I'm not very good. I remember when I, when I, uh, they taught me in Bible school. They tried to teach me in Bible school. Uh, something called homiletics. Have you ever heard of homiletics? And they taught you to sort of like, you know, start the sermons with like, Four C's or something like that, or four, you know, four the four P's. Letter, you know, and I start a sermon like, God is powerful, God is persevering, God is, and I, I couldn't think of another P. He's like, he's he's punctual. <laughs> um, but but as I was, but as I was, as I was working on this on this message that God was giving to me, is you know, here's the sense of, of God wanting to start with us in a place of communion. But he wants that communion to be translated into a life of compassion. But something sometimes in the middle causes that communion not to translate into compassion. That's the cares of this world that choke away the compassion. So in other words, then the, the compassion gets choked out into the, your own selfish cares. And we get to a place where we're absorbed with ourselves. We've bought into this false consumer mentality of religion. And it's choked away the compassion in our life. And now we wonder, well, why, why is it that I don't get stirred? What is it that, that causes me week after week to hear sermon after sermon, but not live my life of faith in the midst of a dark and dying culture, shining the most brilliant light that God has called me to have? Why don't I do that? It's because there's been this choking away. Now I'm going to just wrap things up with one last passage of verse, verse of the Bible book of Isaiah, if you would, please. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah 58. It's a passage of scripture you're probably quite familiar with. But Isaiah 58 says to me, it says, it says something that I think is profound. It says to me that sometimes communion doesn't translate into compassion because sometimes we have to become obedient in compassion before the communion springs forth. Now, for the last 50 years or so, since the charismatic renewal in America, there's been a, a school of thought, and it is a correct school of thought, but it's not a complete school of thought. And this school of thought is communion is always what establishes compassion. 
But then the problem is, why do we have churches that are so full of a desire for communion, singing songs, loving prayer meetings, loving worship hours, loving to come to meetings like this and singing songs, but not translating into real compassion in society? Why isn't there the conviction to see social things change in our neighborhoods? And I think it has to do with sometimes we think the only pursuit is communion. And Isaiah 58 seems to turn the tables, as Jesus did in the temple, turn the tables upside down and say, it says sometimes you have to seek out a heart of compassion and then communion will follow. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't listen to what, what it says here, the first, oh, I'd say, four verses are talking about you're, you're greedy for gain. You're looking out for your own interest. You're fasting and humbling yourself to get noticed by God. It even says that at the end of verse 3. Have you not noticed God? You do things to please yourself is what this is saying. And at the end of verse 4, God says, You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Amos is saying the same thing. You're expecting through communion alone, through just being intimate with Jesus, just, oh, I love you, Jesus. You're so good to me, and I want to sing worship songs, and I want to pray prayers, and I want to read my Bible, and I want to study, and I want to pray, and I want to fast, and I want to know you more. And, and, and Amos and Isaiah, these mighty prophets of God, speak a powerful message to the church in America today, saying that it's not exclusively enough just to have communion. That communion that is not married with compassion is not really true communion. And he goes on to say here in verse 6, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the bands of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide for the poor wandering with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. Verse 10. And you will, and if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will arise out of darkness and your night become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. God is saying here that sometimes... He calls upon his people who are struggling in their community because compassion is missing. Not just to go back and say, oh God, revive me again. Or, oh God, I need to go to another revival. Or, I need to go to another fast. I need to go to another prayer meeting. I need to hear a sermon that will somehow get my heart stirred again. But sometimes God requires in the church, he goes, you know what? There's no more communion. There's no more songs of praise. There's no more delightful intimacy in your presence until you get compassionate. I've had enough, he's saying, of, the, of, of just songs alone that is not married with a heart that says, the world is in trouble. And God loves this world. He gave his only son that it wouldn't perish, but it would come to have life. Yes, heaven, but not only heaven, but, but life. And, and Jesus says, compassion. And a, and a rich man, walk, uh, excuse me, a, a, a religious man walks up to him and says, what do I have to do to get this kind of life? And Jesus says, what do you say? What do you say on this? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you said it well. That's the fullness of the gospel right there. Love God and love your neighbor. But who is the neighbor? And Jesus goes on to tell him something very surprising for a Jew to hear. Jesus is saying, your neighbor is not in your area. Your neighbor is not part of your economic, social and economic level. Your neighbor is not your own nationality, and your neighbor is not even your own faith. Your neighbor is very different than you, and your neighbor is in trouble. Because Jesus said, it's, it's easy to love people that love you. It's easy to invite people who are just like you to a party. It's easy to invite them over for dinner if they go to another Assembly of God church, if they sing like you, speak like you, talk like you, worship like you, it's easy to fellowship with them. And Jesus tells him, here's what love is. Here's what compassion is. Is when you get outside of that box, when you get outside those four walls and put your faith to work, get your faith activated in action. Let compassion, let justice, let mercy roll, let it flow. Let the flowing of the Holy Spirit in you flow out of you. 
That's how my dad, many years ago, he's told me this many times, that's how he started Teen Challenge. He said, if this is Pentecost, we're just going to sit here and sing songs and speak in tongues, and nobody's life is going to be changed, and the world's dying, going to hell, we don't even care because we're happy with our few little people in our church. If that's Pentecost, he said, then I don't want it. Not that he didn't want the power, not that he didn't want the gifts of the Spirit, but he wanted something more. That Pentecost, the communion with God, had to translate into true service for humanity. Had to translate into visible action in a realm outside the four walls of the church. I don't know who I'm speaking to here tonight, but I'm speaking to some people specifically about a major transition in your life, a powerful move of God. Because you've had, as Paul said, for a long time now, 10,000 tutors. You've heard more messages than you can remember. And now God's saying, it's time to take that communion and translate it into real compassion. And God wants to give you new neighbors. This church, other churches that have come into this building tonight, wherever you are, he wants to give you new neighbors. Neighbors with people who don't speak like you. They use a lot of bad language. They do a lot of bad things in what you consider bad. They're, they're not moral. They're not from the same religion. They might not even have a religion. And they may be in the worst turmoil that can be known. Within a, a number of miles of this particular building, there are some of the worst needs in America. Some of the most pressing needs in the world are right here in your state. There, 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 there are things that need to be done in the lives of children. One of the great, one of the, one of the, the issues that's, that I think is, is, is important in the political campaign that's coming right now is one of the politicians is saying that there are two Americas. And he's absolutely right. I don't believe with everything he believes in, but I believe he's right on that, on that, on that case. There are two Americas. There is a, a wealthy, affluent America. There's a middle class America. And there's poverty in America. And, and, and Christians who have affluence need to hear the words of Amos. Let it flow. There was a thing in the 1980s in America called the trickle-down economics. And they believed if you kind of encouraged the wealthy, it would eventually trickle down to the poor. The problem was it never trickled down. It all stayed in the pockets of the wealthy and greedy people. And God is saying, well, let justice flow down. Let it roll down like a mighty river flowing down into people's lives that need it. And I pray that God, please teach me, train me, convict me, rebuke me, move me to a new realm where it's not just all about me. Or not just not a self-indulgent life where what I what the great blessings he's given me are translated into ways that I can give my time, my energy, my money to other people around me. Jesus, we pray now that you would touch our lives, you would transform us. These are just words unless you come and through your Holy Spirit's power uh, pierce people's hearts and lives to where it sinks in and, and really does a, a work of development in their hearts. Lord, I'm not looking for a, a big altar call. I'm not looking for a, an emotional move of God. I'm not looking for uh, signs of revival. I'm looking for hearts that say, God, develop in me a strong, unflinching conviction that my life is meant to count in the society and the world around me. That I am called to serve a great purpose in this world. Lord, be it through the material blessings you've given us. There are many here who have, who have a, a moderate amount of income they can give. There are many here who are called to pray. They can walk out in the streets in the worst neighborhoods and do prayer walks. There are others who are called to, to serve in, in different places like the, even the Boy Scouts or, or mentoring children or serving in an after school program. There are those who can serve in, in the in homeless shelters for the elderly or there are those in this building here right now who could find a place to give their heart of compassion. How quick we are, Lord, to look for new sermons that interest us, new schools of thoughts, new revivals, new songs, new worship tapes or CDs. We're quick to pursue those things, but how slow we often are, Lord, to search out ways to be compassionate. And we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us and cleanse us. Cleanse me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for how easy it is to lose the heart of compassion and just look for my own blessing. Benefit. Would you stand with me, please? Father, now as we pray for people that have come to this building tonight, there are some who have walked in and they know that they know that they know that this is one of those divine moments in their life. 
this is, this is a crossroads for them. And they've been battling a little bit with this issue. Lord, should I really give my life away? Should I lay it all down on the altar? Father, there are people you want to see that transformation from. They're not bad people. They're not uh, corrupt. But there's just been this propensity, this slight tendency to, to uh, let self be the, the thing that most powerfully and clearly operates in their life. And the transition tonight that they want to face and come across, the, the river they want to cross tonight is uh, a river from self into compassion and service. And if that's you tonight, I want to invite you, wherever you are, in the back, in the front, on the sides, so come down here in the front for just a moment. In a moment, I'm going to pray for you, a prayer of faith. I'm going to believe God will do a tremendous work of transformation. That you may have walked in here battling with, or not even knowing that you were battling with it, but you've recognized tonight the Holy Spirit's convicting you. Like there's something about the power that it's been, it's been about me and I've been disappointed and I feel like there's some anger and bitterness in my heart and it's because of this little bit of misunderstanding and I want to get that right so that my life is a life that's called to be given away out of you. God can do that miracle in your life tonight. I want to invite you to your friends tonight. I want to invite you right now wherever you are standing in this place to get out of your seat Come join me here at the front here. I'm going to pray a simple prayer of faith over you. You can believe that God will do a transformation in your life. Come down. Your sense of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The stirring is that God change my heart. Make me a man and a woman for others. Come down. We'll pray this morning.
desire that His will be done on earth, just as being done in heaven. You have this vision for earth, Lord, to look like it is in heaven, with peace, joy, and life, and laughter. Thank you. 
that you'll listen to that voice and begin to pray about those things that God would be able to use you when He wants to use you and how He wants to use you. I believe that that's happening. I know it's happening in my life and my own life that's been happening in the last few months. And I know Gary's just, the Lord's just been dumping on him about the need in the world and how much need there is. And what, you know, what can we do? And there are things that we can do. If, if all of us do just a little bit, it adds up to a bunch. That's what God has been showing Gary and I. That it's not about giving a whole bunch of what we have, it's giving a little bit. And God has a way of multiplying that. When we're willing to put that out there for our purpose. That's what we're going to do. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Lord. It was just so blessed to be with you here tonight. And uh, tomorrow morning, we want to invite the men to come and visit at 9 o'clock here tomorrow. 9 o'clock for breakfast with the men. We look forward to meeting with you and have some specific things to say and speak into your life. And we want you to be here. And then also tomorrow night at 7, here at Matthew will be ministering in music and sharing his heart. We don't want to miss tomorrow night. The Lord has brought him through some, such tremendous things. And you'll be able to relate to that. Some of your own needs. God is there and he's faithful. So, so come back tomorrow night. Invite your friends. Invite people to come. Back be with us. So we'll be here with you Sunday as well. For those of you that are part of this church, we'll be here with you on Sunday morning. Pastor Tom, if you Praise God. What an incredible word. <clears throat> I was sitting here tonight and I was getting preoccupied. I was trying to really focus on Pastor Gary was sharing, and uh, and I really did focus, but I had a little, <laughs> I had a little, had a little moment, and I was thinking, God, I have invited so many people. I found out it was on TV and radio, and I didn't even know it was going in places it was. And I was thinking, this place, we should have had to open the windows, and people stood in the alley to to hear this word. These are choice. Servants, I personally believe that they're they're of the order of the generals in God's kingdom, and uh, the Lord just interrupted my bit of frustration. And don't get me wrong, you're precious. Jesus was known for stopping and ministering to one person. And he emphasized how important one per person was. I'm not talking about that. But I was just sorry for people that, that missed being here tonight. And the Lord said, you know, Tom, my son was came into a fleshly body 2,000 years ago. And only a few wise people showed up for that. <laughs> so don't be discouraged. So uh, God bless you wise guys. Praise the Lord. It's going to be awesome, guys, tomorrow morning. There's been a little bit of question about the breakfast. There's no charge uh, whatsoever for the breakfast.